Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. Uh, I, I'm going to begin with the more standard part of the introduction and then move from there uh, to the more interesting bits. Tonight, we're super lucky to have Nader Tarani come to the Knowlton School of Architecture. Nader is principal of the Boston and now Boston and New York-based practice NADA, uh, who over the last few years have completed an impressive array of buildings, uh, installations, and infrastructures in Melbourne, Washington, D.C., New York, Massachusetts, and elsewhere. His firm is the winner of the prestigious Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Architecture and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Architecture Award, as well as 17 Progressive Architecture Awards along with many other professional citations. Uh, in addition to his work with NADA, Nader is also currently serving as the Dean of Cooper Union's Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture in New York. Now, I, I know Nader uh, better from his tenure between 2010 and 2014 as the head of the Department of Architecture at MIT. And having several folks in the audience tonight who were there during that period of time, uh, I've been reminded recently of a kind of peculiar pattern of speech, uh, which not only allows you to spot any architect who studied at MIT between 2010 and 2014, uh, but is one which I always associate, in fact, with Nader. And specifically, that's the insistence on describing virtually any activity that an architect might do during the course of their day as a form of research. Now, I first encountered this use of research to describe what, until then, I had mostly regarded as the kind of banal activities that, that might comprise the day-to-day -day labors of architecture or an architecture student. Uh, and it struck me as a kind of, only the kind of peculiar affectation which you often encounter in architecture school. These words which sort of occur and move around the school for a few months before disappearing in favor of something more fashionable uh, or sometimes more esoteric. <clears throat> in this case, uh, it was an affectation that I thought of as symptomatic of a particular kind of anxiety that architecture has often felt regarding the conflicted instrumentality of our own unique forms of knowledge. An anxiety made all the more acute in a place like MIT where architecture finds itself surrounded by a collection of harder sciences for whom the word research refers to far more institutionalized collections of epistemologies uh, and technical protocols. But to my surprise, uh, and eventually to my delight, what at first seemed to be a momentary catchphrase uh, didn't quickly go away. In fact, this desire to obstinately consider everything as a possible form of research soon revealed itself not only as one of Nader's primary pedagogical ambitions for the school, uh, but I think uh, a helpful clue to better understand his work in general. This work, Nader's research, confronts architecture's anxiety surrounding the term itself, aware on one hand that architecture's agency is defined by its ability to control a reality otherwise inaccessible to others, while at the same time cognizant of the fact that our very means of ensuring this control through specialized forms of representation and simulation, or perhaps through an expertise in the processes of material assembly, are almost exclusively derived from our encounters with peripheral spheres of expertise, such as geometry or material manufacturing. But while an awareness of these anxious edges of architectural knowledge has long pushed architecture towards shoring up of its own interior certainties, Nader's work regards these ambiguous spaces of overlap between architecture and what lies outside of it as a site for what I can only describe as a radical intellectual and professional gambit. To obstinately refer to these peripheral activities as sites of research is to claim that these spheres of expertise, typically managed by a project's numerous external consultants, are in fact already uniquely architectural forms of knowledge, simply yet to be discovered. Nader's work treats these con the contingencies of project budgets, material assemblies, and manufacturing processes as the optimistic grounds upon which we, may, we might redraw our range of thinking. In practice, this intellectual project manifests itself through an investigation into the relationship between geometry and assembly, extending architecture's range by treating domains typically seen as lying within the purview of construction managers and contractors as alternative sites for architectural intellection. Now, this weekend, I was thinking about how to introduce Nader, and I was G-chatting with several uh, classmates of mine. Uh, and mostly we were just sharing stories of Nader in studio, which I probably shouldn't uh, share here. Uh, but it occurred to me while we were talking that one of these folks uh, currently writes uh, software, architectural design software. Uh, another one uh, works on uh, public art projects. Uh, and a third is working on inventing a, a 3D printer, a kind of architectural scale 3D printer. Uh, so at a certain point, it occurred to me that this kind of generational confidence uh, to include such diverse and seemingly peripheral activities under an expanded umbrella of architecture 
Not to mention, of course, the diverse pursuits which all of you will undertake after leaving school here, in no small part owes a debt of gratitude to what seemed at first to be a peculiar affectation, generously put forward by Nader to insist both on the confidence to call these activities architectural research and the rigor to turn this shared affectation into a kind of promise. So we're very excited tonight to see the current state of Nader's research. Please join me in welcoming Nader Tarani. To admit, uh, I was struggling to 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 l listen to you in part because of the echo in the room, uh, in in another part because I I don't think I've ever had such a dense introduction in my life. So <laughs> I I thank you for that, and I will publicly here ask you if you don't mind sending it to me by email. <laughs> <laughs> and. It was so good, I want to use it in a book, please. So. <laughs> um, when, when you look at the question of research in other fields, uh, they come with a certain level of definition uh, in hi historiography, uh, archival research, uh, primary and secondary sources, and there's certain canons against which it is measured, and certainly scientific research uh, has uh, its own protocols. Somehow, as designers, we fall through the cracks, uh, and it shows itself almost instantaneously as we enter as young faculty members because nobody knows how to measure you. Somewhere between acts of speculation in creativity, uh, explorations in science, and cultural studies, uh, the barometers against which uh, the value of certain discoveries are made are constantly confused. And so uh, I'm always shy of saying that we are doing research, but I also know that we're never doing something. We're always doing iterations of things, which is a demonstration uh, as a bottom line that you're constantly mistrusting what you're doing. To the extent that tonight is about research, in fact, it is focused on something that was not premeditated 20 years ago, uh, but emerged, let's say, out of the fabric of the work, if you like, out of the grain of the work. And it's a very narrow lens uh, through a wide variety of projects, some new, mostly new, uh, but some old, to put it in perspective, way too many slides, and so sometimes I'll just go fast through them just to pr give them historical context, but, but not to, to lurk too much uh, within that. The idea of grain in our minds is somehow natural, and when we look at this, we sort of take it for granted. When we look at the next image, uh, we realize how mistaken we were. The first image obviously was fabricated because we all know that the grain of the stripes go perpendicular to, to the legs and to the torso and have to reconcile themselves somewhere in between at that junction, essentially in, the, in that joint between the column and the entablature. So when we do things like this, we know that we are operating architecturally on the zebra uh, as a heretical act. We are doing something unnatural. And in fact, that is always what we're doing in architecture. Of course, there is a grain to wood. And if we have a predisposition about operating with materiality, uh, you have to know what it means to work with the grain or bend with the grain rather than against it. Things will happen. But when you saw the wood, that produces its own grain also, which may work with or against the grain. So there's a kind of industrial analog to what is also naturally embedded within that grain. And of course, all of you know what the difference is between uh, a quarter sawn cut and uh, uh, rotary uh, cut and so forth. For this reason, when we did uh, this coffee table, this is early in our careers when we were w uh, fascinated with butcher block technology using plywood as our constant, 
with quarter sawn walnut uh, on one axis and uh, zebra wood uh, on the inner liner uh, that you see in the underbelly uh, of this table, we discovered that there's this strange semantic moment where the oblique produces a kind of symmetry, which is a very architectural idea because you've seen it in Palladio, you've seen it in Mies, but the vertical turning of a corner is part of one grain. The extension of the top coming down on one axis is another natural extension uh, of that grain, but there's always the third axis which is ir irreconcilable, and this is a kind of rule. It's, uh, it's an undeniable rule and it's something you cannot overcome. But our preoccupation with grain emerges from things that are that detailed uh, and then prone to manipulation. The, the mere manner of producing a table leg, which as we all know comes from the structural forces of the diminution of dim dimension or the enlargement of dimension as it goes to its capital, produces yet a third grain, which I will call figuration here. Something that is, uh, emerges from the grain, but uh, produces a kind of figural surplus that is not part of the par parallel uh, graining of, uh, of that uh, piece of wood. My fascination with grain, of course, uh, has its echoes in classical architecture, and uh, I think I've even shown this slide here before, but I've always been fascinated by uh, Bramante Santa Maria della Pace and the idea that somehow, either by mistake or by heresy, uh, the classical orders are swallowed up in that corner. Look at that sad little capital as it gets swallowed up, uh, engulfed by the wall. And, and for me, this is, this is, in a strange way, this is the sign that architecture exists. Because you know it's either a mistake or you know that that compression uh, of what would otherwise be a natural ionic uh, order uh, makes well, provokes you to think, but makes you know that somebody was thinking about that. They either drew it, or precisely not. They either forgot to draw it, and this is what results naturally. So, The Rock Creek House is, uh, is an exercise in graining. It evolves out of an old house from the 1920s, uh, fabricated of brick, uh, two-story house with an attic and a basement. The basement opens up into a backyard and the attic was a playroom. So the real question of the house programmatically was how to turn a two-story house into a four-story house, uh, maintain the family intact, stay in the neighborhood, stay in the local schools, uh, and radically transform the house. Respecting the order of that house, what we tried to do was to open up the southern face, the opposing side of this image, in such a way that it opens up into the Rock Creek context of Washington, D.C., drawing in the sun and then using the brick that we carved out of those openings to add onto the attic floor. So the diagram is a landscape strategy. It's a cut and fill. But effectively in doing that, what you do, what you end up doing is making a curtain wall out of the southern wall because there's just no way that brick actually operates that way. No longer do they span as vaults or arches or anything like that. At that point, you are migrating from a load-bearing wall on the northern side to a curtain wall on the southern side. And these are two very different conditions. And part of the operation of this house uh, was about uh, extracting the iconography out of the brick and treating it as a skin. The other thing that this resulted in was a planimetric alteration of the house whereby the northern side reinforces the cubicles of load-bearing conditions 
while in key instances of the public areas opens up the southern side to become a free plan. And in that sense, it's a hybrid, uh, bringing back a, a kind of classical ordering system on the one hand with, uh, if you like, modern planning, contemporary planning in the sense of opening up uh, that, uh, the grain of the plan. Most importantly, we relied on the north-south walls to maintain the continuity of shear walls without which uh, such a building could not stand, at least in terms of the lateral forces. The southern wall, which ho is housed now by steel frame, acts as a kind of moment frame on the long axis. And then the architecture that is inserted within it is that plywood, that plywood that is a butcher block that ends up running on the north-south grain that essentially is, uh, instead of the furniture and fixture, if you like, it is really the, the millwork that is the architecture of this project. In tandem with this, uh, a kind of operation on the section of the house In other words, uh, putting the question of uh, economics aside, this is a wealthy project, but economic in terms of its dimensions. The grain of the wood that you see on the left then reinforces the idea of porosity and transparency on the north-south axis, and you're constantly walking against that grain so that you have the flat planes on the side and the end grains on the opposing sides. And when you have the flat grains, effectively they close. So in fact, instead of having doors, this entire wall above here slides to the left way and another right wall slides uh, laterally in that same grain. So somehow the idea of graining is also reinforced in the mechanics and the kinetics of the pieces that complete that diagram. The spiraling then of the stair is relatively straightforward, but then uh, rendered somehow dynamic by the kind of syncopation of the grain going in one way uh, and the opposite way. And then somehow, because of that also, the implantation of the fixtures and the you know, electrical outlets and all of the others are somehow uh, embedded uh, within the logic of this. Door handles are carved out of that same grain. Uh, and of course, you get into moments of the oblique, uh, the turning of the corner, uh, where uh, you overcome the immediacy of that grain through the glazing system, which uh, escapes that logic. In those moments, the grains inhabit the zone uh, of that moment, reinforcing the role of furnishings uh, with the glazing as a kind of sheet of ice, if you like, that uh, surrounds it. And then there's those few moments where we constantly try to escape the logic of, of the grain by creating figural moments, much like the leg of the table, where door handles uh, and other fixtures get embedded uh, within the logic of that grain. Again, this is a, obviously an adaptive uh, reuse uh, of an existing structure. Um, done painstakingly difficultly uh, with a contractor that who refused to, to work with us. There's another theme I could be presenting tonight, uh, that all of these projects, for better or for worse, uh, 
come with the resistance of, of uh, collaborators who don't want to collaborate. But they're interesting ones because, uh, in essence, one could say that everything we do as architects somehow are irrelevant to the rest of the world. Uh, and so establishing systems, well, there are systems out there in the world uh, and, and we can elect to work with those systems, but even to work consistently with their systems will not uh, guaranteed, guarantee compliance between the various orders that are in place. So invariably structural systems, mechanical systems, um, millwork systems will be rendered uh, somehow incoherent by the overlap of these various agencies working together. So much of our work actually goes into the building up of a, an ordering system beyond the drawings to create the possibility of coordination. In the context of Korea, where we don't speak the language and where we don't have the immediacy of going to the job site, this becomes all the more important because uh, the loss in translation is guaranteed from the get-go. In what is called the model home gallery, uh, an institution which often looks like these curious buildings you see at the top, uh, is an invention that in my mind is purely Korean. That is, they are model homes, just like you would see on a job site in America somewhere, that is a sample apartment of the apartment building you're building next door. The difference there is that they will have in the black box above about 20 units impeccably fabricated, coordinated with interactive technologies, quite sophisticated, we don't have that here, and these are all temporary buildings. In order to get them built for 10 years to 20 years, they make a deal with the local neighborhood to provide for public amenities at the base, which include meeting rooms, uh, theaters, uh, coffee houses, uh, leasable rooms, and so forth. And then within the, those 20 apartments represent units within not one apartment building or two, but up to 40 or 50. And so the logic of this institution is actually quite important. And broken down, it's just that. It's essentially a glass box at the base uh, with the promise of a kind of urban porosity and continuity and a dumb box at top, which in their mind does not suffice. Hence the hysteria that you see here uh, is actually part of the idea of branding uh, that they think is uh, critical to representing, in this case, Samsung. This is the site as we discovered it, uh, which would be transformed in less than six months. That entire area in front of you, minus the park on the right, would be built up. It's that speed against which you're building. Uh, and so we essentially did just that, a glass box at the base with the promise of connecting the urban corner with the park, uh, loft spaces above, about 20, uh, 20 foot ceilings, with an atrium that connects you up to it as that one moment of juncture between the public and uh, uh, the sales pitch offices upstairs. In a project that lasted no more than a year and a half, we completed the working drawings in about four months. We delivered the, the drawings, I, I believe, around November and never heard from them again until we received this image in January or February sometime. <laughs> telling us that we've run into some glitches with the turning of the corner uh, and we need you on site immediately. And so we realized then that we'd made a key decision that may at the end help us. We only made four decisions and that is about the grain of the floor, the grain of the mullions, uh, the grain of the louvers on top of those mullions on the top volume, 
uh, and subsequently the grain of the uh, soffits, the hung ceilings, where that is how we organize the, the lights, the mechanical equipment and so forth. So in effect, the building is reduced to four details. And strangely enough, the louvers that you see at the top have nothing to do with environmental control systems. They have to do, in, in, a, in effect, with the breaking down of a compound curvature so that you would never detect the flaws in construction because they would fall in the shade of the horizontal louver. The urban diagram that this is trying to fulfill ultimately is a building that is built from the sky down and suspended from above to touch the floor. In effect, the columns, the atrium, the escalators, the bathrooms conceptually are all suspended upside down with a granite sidewalk that comes into the building and goes right through it. That was the rendering and this is the built result. Virtually no different, not particularly well crafted, but perfectly built nonetheless because that is essentially what results when you don't have details. Uh, with the grain essentially acting to mute uh, what is otherwise uh, patched over by a plaster surface uh, engulfing all of the uh, systems that are overhead. Maybe the only spatial or organizational um, surplus that this building offers is this idea that the theater is not a black box, but that it uh, establishes a porosity with the gallery in the front and the landscape beyond there, or the idea that the stage can act from one side to the other. Typologically conceived as a, as a hypostyle hall, we also essentially enlarge some of those columns to engulf spaces, to become rooms themselves, while maintaining the porosity of the overall uh, plan in order to permit the passage of the public from the park through the building and onto the urban edge. The plan above is relatively straightforward. It's just a factory open, in the industrial space essentially opened with units. And then there's the grain, the grain of the vertical mullions at the base and the horizontal grain of what's above. The verticality of the grain uh, establishes a, a kind of caterpillar-like uh, uh, malleability so that it can open up where you, needed, uh, where you need more access to the outside, have deepened the louvers where you need shade from the sun on the east and the west, or gain fritting as a result of it. And the structural systems tolerated no customization. So it's essentially a domino frame that is chamfered and then clad with this um, uh, series of templates on the horizontal grain that incrementally bend the metal uh, as they are pixelated uh, and discretized uh, on the surface. Uh, of, uh, of the face, essentially resulting in a figural um, orb on top which speaks to the, the landscape of, of Seoul with a base uh, that does it in a completely different way. The diagram of the building is essentially this, a series of mullions as T's and columns as T's that establish a generic grain uh, at the base, effectively get recalibrated on the horizontal axis. The roof, once it gets uh, programmed from within, pushes up and pushes down in relationship to double height spaces, two-story spaces, and the top merely lands on it and winks back at you where there's programs that need light, otherwise it's a black box. The idea of grain is translated across a variety of projects, 
And in this shift in scale to the New Hampshire House, we had this curious uh, luxury of a site almost at the top of a mountain or a hill, I should say, that has this vast perspective onto the presidential range in New Hampshire. And this gave us the opportunity to imagine a house in the round that could control its context, uh, almost in a panoptic relationship with that landscape, with every room pointed at one of the mountain peaks. It also offered the possibility of imagining a linear house, but on a radius, such that uh, controlled interior spaces could be syncopated with exterior spaces that connect the inner courtyard uh, with the outside environment of the raw landscape. The diagram of the building then is composed of the grain of these rooms, each of them with their own view, isolated and discreet. In between them a series of porches or uh, balconies if you like, and that all of these would be occupied in slightly different ways depending on time of day or the amount of people staying there uh, or the activities that go on with a kind of sacred space in the center uh, essentially sheltered from the uh, raw environment of the New Hampshire winters. Each room then is uh, insular in its nature and very much focused on its view in relationship to the various um, mountains, and the section uh, is composed of a core in the basement that is the parking that then comes up with a stair spiraling up uh, and engaging uh, eventually a roof deck that gains the entire gamut uh, uh, of this view. I'll speak to the plan further a little bit later, but suffice it to say that the threshold between the outside and the inside of this courtyard is an important one uh, given that the grain of the vertical siding, board and batten, excuse me, uh, tongue and groove in this case, uh, begins to rule itself around the surface of that gateway to make a natural threshold, a transition from the inside to the outside, getting a peek into that courtyard and turning the facade into essentially uh, a canopy uh, that is essentially a landscape strategy uh, uh, with a roof as that landscape. So conceived of uh, uh, from top down, it's a series of rooms that radiate, but conceived configurally, it's really a series of sticks, almost operating like a thicket that once aggregated uh, conspire to something of a much larger order uh, as you begin to see their relationship with the larger ordering system uh, of, of the context within which they are placed. The plan is obviously in direct dialogue with a, a tradition. Here you see both uh, Sterling and Khan, and the ways in which, uh, in one instance, the reliance on typology gains a kind of taxidermic uh, quality, where uh, arenas and basilicas and stoas are essentially stuffed with program, and in Khan's case, a more abstract syntax uh, of relationships between solids and voids uh, create the delicate junction that he's so well known for. Accidental at one level, but highly calibrated at, at another. In our case, of course, uh, we render that connection much more fluid between that which is seen as discrete and that which is seen as fluid. And as such, the junctions are rendered moot and mute at the same time to produce the possibility of visual continuity. And of course, there is also a tradition for that. 
from Herring to Sharun, among others. In this case, though, not with the luxury of plaster, but with the mandate of the built unit, in this case, the uh, board and batten system, uh, and the mandate also that the very systems that activate this have to abide by the principles of that material logic. And so for this uh, project also, the uh, systemic breakdown of fins, of window frames, of tongue and groove systems, of board and batten systems, of pickets for fences, all of them are absorbed into this logic of the infill between the crust of the ground and the crust of the roof, which is a kind of like an ice cream sandwich that holds it all together, layered one more time with the snow of the winter. We were able to convince uh, John Wardle, architects, uh, about something about this fascination with graining when on a second competition we did together, and we won, to imagine a bridge that connects the central park uh, of Melbourne to the, tennis, the, sites, uh, the site of the Tennis Open. And to imagine a bridge uh, whose top is essentially a wide pathway and an extension of that landscape to be relatively simple because the image of the building and the uh, presence of the bridge is really seen only from below. So this is a, this is the design of a, uh, 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 what do you say, an RC, R reflected ceiling plan, RCP. This is about how the fifth facade becomes wrapped up to become railings, uh, lighting, and the structural system that gives it longitudinal and lateral bracing. And the basic logic of this is, is how you take uh, a strand of metal, uh, what angles do you bend it around to enable that kind of lateral stability, but also a longitudinal one, in the same way that a bowstring truss operates on, on the longitudinal axis. Uh, as it floats over the landscape of the park, uh, operating uh, at two different levels of consciousness, one above the horizon line and one below, uh, with the skyline of the city uh, uh, beyond uh, and the, the lighting that gets punctuated from left to right, uh, and the landscape also being forked uh, into two or three different ways uh, as it navigates the different circuits um, uh, of the city. Um, this project, strangely, uh, unlike the, the uh, Melbourne School of Design, uh, within which we had a huge role during construction administration, uh, did not afford that level of involvement. So our, this is the first project, I would say, where our control of the drawings were maniacal and the communication with the contractor uh, close to perfect and, uh, and the delivery, uh, though contentious in many moments, ultimately uh, quite faithful, uh, despite the fact that many other structural considerations were made that would ultimately undermine my claims of the longitudinal stability of this thing. Uh, but nonetheless, quite satisfying to see how far one could get with this. Obviously, uh, there is, in many of the images I have shown, the tension between what we imagine to be what defines the grain of architecture. The dissonance between form and content, uh, between, if you like, the program of the building and how it represents itself on the outside, or in another diagram, the relationship between structure and skin, is made evident historically in a range of other uh, uh, illustrations. In this case, in the era of architecture parlante, what I love in this elephant is the way in which the shoulders become a kind of excuse 
for the arch or the vault in the space that it holds, or the idea that uh, the elephant's snout uh, becomes uh, the receptacle through which uh, water is flows into a fountain. The idea that somehow the figure of the elephant performs uh, and in, re in reciprocal ways. I'm just going to show a couple of these projects which probably most of you have seen, so I'll go quite fast. But they have to do with some of the underlying tenets of these other projects that are operating at a larger scale. In this case, the idea that if you take material agency, that is the logic that materials give you already, in this case corrugation, if you take it seriously, it will form the building for you in the sense that it gives you structural stability on the vertical axis, but malleability on the horizontal. So the ruled surface that is latent within that corrugation is what enables you to create a seamless porch out of the facade that connects the living room by stairs to the garden uh, in this uh, construction. It's also important, and in that way we understood when drawing this, that architectural drawings, unlike illustration, are not pictorial in nature. They are already an act of fabrication. They're already an act of construction. And so in many ways, they defy the kind of iconographic bias that is demonstrated from architecture parlante all the way to some of the more commercial strategies that we have seen today. That same thing is also true when you begin to engage the construction industry and the ways in which the breakdown of materials, whether they're panels of four by eight or Norman bricks or Roman bricks or whatnot, begin to define material limits through which you rehearse the possibility of figuration. In this instance, we inherited the brick, but also a legacy of bonding, whereby uh, Flemish bonds, uh, uh, regular bonds, uh, and a range of other bonds begin to define ways in which, established ways within which one can give structure to walls. We didn't realize the agency of bonding at the time, of course, but as we inspected it, we realized also that the dimension that guides the interstices of the brick at some level are arbitrary. In other words, they could start at 3 8 but they could just incrementally uh, expand to become uh, the Flemish. And in doing so, in this instance, in Casa La Roca, we were able to fold that wall with a single width of brick, giving it lateral stability, but also introducing the prospect of air and light in what would otherwise be a solid, thick wall. This fascination with the surface and with structure was also extended when we discovered Todd's uh, in Tokyo. I loved this image because I also, in my mind, had already projected that this is not a skin. In fact, this is a spatial construction. Much like the tree in front of it, it had a three-dimensional capacity. So I was somewhat shocked when I went to visit it to realize that it's a standard and good if you like modern building stacked on top of each other with a couple of double heights in it with a skin of figuration around it. In many ways, it fell back into a theoretical logic with which we were completely familiar. For this reason, when we, uh, were, on sh we were shortlisted for the Isam Faris Institute in um, Beirut, four little kids, as well as Zaha Hadid, we knew very well the outcome of the competition before we began. And that liberated us to do something that had no claims to winning, 
but had claims to doing something, if you like, more intellectually or academically uh, prone. In this case, the completion of Tobes. Or the imagination that we are doing something that he should have done but did not do. And so the question for me was, how do you develop a geometry, in this case a hexagon, that once truncated has a natural inclination to become a triangle, in order to become a column, uh, a pilotis, a transfer beam once rotated, or just a wall? Uh, I was fascinated with the prospect that geometry in its abstraction could become constantly and denote different architectural elements without the necessity of typological distinction. In a site-specific situation, it also allowed us to embrace and surround walls in the basement to laterally brace things in the middle and to lighten the structure at the top. In turn, it operated with the conventions of the building industry in order to create a domino frame from which one could imagine how those scenarios would operate. Transfer beams in the center, raked structural systems uh, for cantilevers and backspans, uh, uh, as well as uh, auditoria, and the splitting up of those very structural systems as they lighten up at the top. The building then, in effect, for us, was a way to give that structural a three-dimensional embodiment in the context uh, of that competition. For the Guangzhou Biennale, we developed a complex tensegrity structure whose principle was rooted in an idea about customization. And we developed working drawings this thick and delivered it one week early. And, and I'm not showing you the drawings with purpose. And they said they love it. And do you mind if we build the tensile elements as compressive elements, they said to us? And we had to say, no, we don't mind. Because we realized we'd already lost the battle. But if you note what the problem was, of course, is that at the end of the day, tensile structures or tensegrity structures never fit exactly. They're always being calibrated into position. It's almost impossible to get the x, y coordinates perfectly. And so the real problem was really how to build something. So we said to them, okay, let's say we do everything with compress uh, compressive elements. It's no longer tensegrity. So why should we comply with the form that we've already given you? Give us one week and we'll come, by, we'll come back to you with new constraints, but with more flexibility to build it any way you want. So to that end, for the gateway into the old Guangzhou village, we developed a canopy that was the maximum size of the corner. It operates as a canopy around two existing trees with an oculus that lightens the, the canopy as much as possible using less steel, as it were, and inserts itself into the ground on those key moments where there's not added infrastructure. So essentially, we had conceptualized that canopy as a strategic intervention into the context with a very clear figure, as denoted on the right-hand side, and pure, with the legs slanting in slightly different ways to give it lateral stability. But most importantly, with a designation of densities of steel rods that would then speak to the necessities of the compressive loads as you push down on them, the distributive loads when you need a capital, and the lightening of that very structure as a triangulated series of networks above to operate, if you like, as a truss or a vector active structural system. But we didn't draw 
any of these things in location. It was almost like sticks that you throw in there and with the simple specification that each rod needs to be welded to at least two other rods so that there is this constant triangulation between members. And this is a diagram that we gave to them. So in effect, we established a relationship with the director of the Door and Lock Museum in Seoul. He does door handles. As an industry currently, he does door handles. That's what he does for a business. The Door and Lock Museum is a kind of fascination that he has. And every stick that you see here is a door handle. Those vertical door handles that you have in lobbies. And I suppose if there's something satisfying about this project is this notion that, you know, unlike other biennales and, you know, exhibits and all of that where you put things up and take them down, these were commissioned to be permanent structures as part of the amelioration of the urban context within which they are placed. If it is not evident already, there is a fascination that we have with the right-hand side image over the left, even though both of them are part and parcel of this discussion. The bowl, if you like, the cast bowl, is no less composed of aggregates, the grain of, of small pebbles or, or aggregates, even when they're smoothed out and they're brushed down into a kind of a reflective surface. But what fascinates us, us are the systems of distribution of those things like you know, uh, grass or, or other uh, natural tidbits that form the nest next to it. And much of our research uh, in Georgia Tech, in uh, Cambridge, in uh, Sci Arc, amongst other places, are dedicated to the discrete study of materials, their modes of aggregation, and the limits of the geometric and structural predispositions they may have. And so that research is ongoing, constantly fascinated with other people's work and somehow in dialogue with them. Uh, this is Khan in, in Venice and the idea of the kind of inhabitable uh, truss over the Grand Canal. Uh, uh, Gaudi, obviously, with the catenary research that he did. Uh, a recent research that we did, uh, this is a diagram from Axel Killian and the computational um, uh, software that he developed in order to measure the possibility and automate essentially the, the possibility of uh, um, catenary operations, in this case with just uh, uh, paper clips, we were also interested in the idea of a compressive catenary, meaning instead of working with stone or with concrete, working with a high-density foam that in principle is light, but has great compressive strength while operating in tension. What you're looking at, by the way, is the vault in Escorial, uh, in the basement, in the crypt. And because the floor on top of it is where the basilica is, where the church is, it has to be a flat vault. So instead of the center having the keystone, as the only angled piece. In fact, those angles are distributed all the way around the, the vault, bringing the loads down. It's fascinating. And the basis around which our suspended catenary, our compressive catenary, is composed of a series of uh, inverted keystones, if you like, puzzle pieces that interlock with great uh, structural abilities that we had no idea about to create a series of customized units routed on both sides for the BSA uh, exhibit to construct on top of the uh, new uh, quarters designed by Howler and Yoon, suspended as a kind of canopy above them 
uh, in this piece, and instead of, of course, having the keystone in the center, it has the, uh, the kind of void, uh, the invert uh, of that void uh, over the, the context uh, of the staircase. Now, of course, those of you who've already operated with CNC routers and all of that understand that in order to build it, you can build a compound curvature on one side as long as you have a flatbed on the other side. So the inversion of that flatbed on the other side produces facets, but it cannot produce two compound curves. That is rooted in the logic of the setup, but also engages in the possibility of ways in which uh, rustication can be made in the flat side that you can walk on versus the other side, which appears to be suspended. The fascinations that we have with phenomena and the contradictions that become apparent in these grains go back to a lot of those early periods where we were working on furniture, what we could afford. And what seems like a shaker piece of furniture where you can house uh, jewelry on the top and pants on the bottom with t-shirts in the middle, uh, we are also interested in those phenomena that make something look implausible. So there is no necessary dedication to the ethic of actual structure, but, the, but rather to the discourse that produces the tension between the actual structure and the appearance of how something works. To this end, to this end Levity is as important to the actual distribution of structure. And this is why our schools of architecture are in great part dedicated to some of these complex and uh, contradictory uh, encounters with uh, large phenomena, in this case structural. The suspension, the delicate suspension of the new studio space within the high bay of the Hinman building, repurposing the gantry crane uh, with this delicate dance of, of rods, uh, very, very delicately suspended in there given lateral stability uh, is one of those moments. In the context of the Melbourne School of Design, we had the possibility of doing a vertical studio spanned by wood members over 22 meters from which we wanted to integrate the idea of a suspended studio. Very much connected to the uh, catenary, uh, compressive catenary and very much connected to the research that we were doing in uh, Atlanta. In this instance, we wanted to work with the raw structure of LBLs overhead to bring indirect daylighting into the space while suspending three stories of dedicated studio space in what was otherwise a hot space for the entire context of the atrium. The tectonic grain that we speak of here is composed of different scales of that grain. On the one hand, you have the massive 22 uh, meter beams running laterally, the coffers that run longitudinally, the angle of those coffers blocking the direct sunlight coming in. Then there's the grain of the wood that is part of the surface of that that folds down onto the suspended studio. And then there's the actual dimension of that wood between the massive systems of the LVLs and the thin veneers of plywood as it suspends down. The construction of this obviously, not obviously, but actually, is the result of uh, kind of systemic prefabrication of parts brought onto the site and installed in less than a month, part of its efficiency. But the curious magic of it has to do with its actual tectonic transition or metamorphosis from a very heavy timber construction atop to very light systems of cladding uh, with a kind of emphasis, if you like, of the, of the roof uh, materialized in the weight of this uh, dedicated studio 
that descends down into the dimensions of a veneer of plywood as it embodies and gives materiality to a, an acoustic ceiling whose organization is uh, based on the lighting, the sprinkler systems, and the acoustic baffles that are part of that system. This is an important project for us, of course, not only because of its girth and its size, but it was a building that promised for the first time in history studio space for the Melbourne School of Design. The one thing they were unable to do was to provide studio space. It was value engineered out of the project after the first month. And so the result of that was a different kind of engineering on our part in the sense that we took the corridors of an existing type expanded those corridors by three or four feet to create what we call the vertical studio. So the, uh, if you look carefully at the desks, well, the, these panels all rotate to become crit spaces. The second floor is all collective, collaborative spaces for model making and conferences. One layer above that are drafting uh, spaces all around, and one layer above that are social spaces and crit spaces. In other words, the success of this project in great part is the result of not having studios and therefore having it occupied 24-7 in this vertical balcony system that eradicates the rails but produces out of the FF&E a kind of infrastructure of work that makes it uh, populated in the way that it is. The third school of architecture on which we're working and currently completing is uh, uh, the University of Toronto. Uh, and I can't complain, uh, excuse me, complain, uh, I have plenty of complaints. Uh, I can't explain all of its details, but want to focus on the roof, uh, whose grain, whose structural grain, brings the project in many ways together composed of an old building on the south and a new building on the north, brought together conceptually as a landscape. Uh, much of this project has to do with the battle that we waged in producing in the minds of the client, the contractor, and everybody on board the veracity of a roof that could do more than one thing. The challenge of this building at a very low budget was to bring a conventional structural system to a halt on the third floor and then use the two cores that we had as anchors for a long span structural system who would which would also which would solve the daylighting issues the hydrology issues and the structural issues in one instance to create the monumentality of a grand studio space that had the promise of transforming their program of course, like all projects, it was way over budget, allegedly, and on top of it, it was unbuildable because the contractor refused to accept that a developable surface is composed of a two-dimensional conventional surface. So on one of my trips to Melbourne, I called the office and I asked what would be the possibility of just building a mock-up within our own studio, which resulted in this stud construction uh, surfaced with a jip board and later with a radiant panel that demonstrated that not only could we get the heating from the floor but the cooling from the ceiling. In other words, a fully embedded system that would eventually transform into something that would save them about $700,000 making it almost impossible for them not to build it. <laughs> Conceptualize this essentially as a scissor truss with rule surfaces that clad the in-between, it is actually broken down into trusses with a conventional corrugated deck. Uh, the radiant panels and the jip board would go under that seam in order to uh, give surface to what is now becoming complete uh, in Toronto. It's uh, incredibly badly built, but and yet somehow something about the composition of this building as a party is so strong that it defies 
those things which we cannot accept. How are you doing? Good? So I end with uh, these anecdotes about other ongoing projects, but with the focus of the grain uh, on our mind. Zooming back to the scale of the house, uh, the clients of the Rock Creek House, the house that I began with, uh, wanted to build uh, an important house on the Mediterranean for which we were no longer asked to do construct, uh, construction administration. Um, our dedication to their project frightened them too much. And yet, somehow, uh, they keep sending us images of its construction process, uh, somehow as if to torture us or to tease us with the fact of having been fired. And yet, they're building it uh, exactly as it should be. The house is quite simple. On a s slope of a hill, it's composed of an upper and a lower wing with a s courtyard and a swimming pool uh, in the center. The upper L has essentially the living rooms, kitchen, uh, and the master uh, bedroom and the suite uh, on one side. And the lower L underneath that more or less is a series of dorm rooms across the corridor of which there's a series of broken down toilet shower facilities that can be used more randomly almost so that seven rooms can turn into multiple rooms for over 22 people within the family. The conceptual strategy of this project is rooted in an idea about a courtyard typology and what happens to it as you orient, on the one hand, to the vastness of the Mediterranean and the discrete views of the upper hill, the idea that the section of the site would have an impact on the purity of an internalized typology, the L would protect it from the context, it's quite a dense neighborhood at the end, and more than anything, that the grain of these Ls would produce a threshold such that the landscape that runs through the building becomes much more important than the objecthood of the house itself. Needless to say, there's nothing less object-like than this house. The relationship between the typological grain of this house and its material grain is also what is at stake, and we'll talk about that because it's the first time also that we've dealt with concrete, which is no longer discretized in a series of elements like brick and like sticks and so forth. And yet the formwork has a direct relationship with what you see. The imprint is what's at stake. The front facade, in fact, is a large blank facade, which in effect is a beam, not a facade. Upon entry, you get that vast and horizontal view, a kind of modern uh, contemporary case study house that not only extrudes and opens up that view, but more importantly, produces a vault that doesn't span laterally, but longitudinally to bring in the Western light in relationship to the Pinus Pinei that are on the upper side of the hill. The house works in the round, not on one axis only. And so its relationship with the site is 360. The junction of the grain of the house comes together in this curious moment of the cantilever, which is the embodiment of the stair itself that makes it work like a donut, essentially. You go up and down and up and down on the two corners, allowing for the lateral, diagonal penetration of that landscape coming up and through the house on the opposing axis. But watch this wall here, because that is a wall like the other. And that is what maintains the integrity of this entire house together, without which it would not stand. Because that is the edge of this swimming pool that holds up an entire cantilever, in effect, as in a T-junction. 
Essentially, that wall on the right is what holds up uh, the possibility of that facade as it gets punctured by small windows within those bathrooms, but in effect is there to contain the integrity of that house. Going back to the question of the concrete, I've always been fascinated by uh, A, the liquid state within which we find concrete as a raw material, the result of cement aggregates and, and, and water and so forth, but also its expression, which is either the result of its formwork, which could be anything, or post-production work, which is the love of labor that is cast into it or extracted out of it after the fact. And we have seen a good bit of research uh, around this topic uh, with the right-hand side image, something I discovered in this very school, I believe, under Ashley, I'm not sure. In the context of this house, we did two different researches. One was with the idea of using formwork as a representational device, essentially to produce rustication through a kind of iconographic deformation of a smooth surface with foam that was routed out to go from the condition of the smooth and taut facade of the exterior to the uh, bulbous and, uh, and uh, rock-like, uh, grotto-esque carving of its interior. And certainly that is a strategy. Uh, but then we said, what if we try another technique altogether? What if we look at the constitution of concrete itself as the means through which we develop variable aggregates and then begin to build the context such that this interior of the building is smooth, concrete, but then through cast panels begin to introduce larger chunks of aggregate, much like Talies and West, which effectively becomes the stone walls of southern France in the way that they divide up the properties anyway. And so you begin to see the transition of mortar into concrete walls within the grain of the landscape itself, making a more persuasive relationship with the, with the house as an object and the house as an extension of that landscape. Part of this argument is also rooted in the notion that it is, at the end, being built out of wood. And the grain of that wood is right there, almost within the pigment of the concrete itself, almost as if the wood veneer was somehow cast uh, into the coloration of the concrete itself. I remember when I first went to Rome and discovered the graining of the streets, the cobblestones, and had no idea that maybe the distribution of stone had something to do with the body and the way in which labor was optimized in the context of somebody on their knees with the arc of their hands giving an imprint to the way in which the streets are ordered. And imagine that for over 2,000 years, even when we tag the subway system, somehow, whatever the expression, whatever the content of the tag, it still remains related to that uh, aspect of the body. Now, of course, as we build with cranes and other industrial equipment, we talk about a one-man stone and a two-man stone. It could be a person or a woman, but in effect, uh, the mediation of cranes and other vehicles become uh, translated into the industrial moment. And yet somehow with the introduction of robotics and the possibility in which the material sciences through biology and other vehicles become to inseminate themselves and influence the way we think about construction, there begins the possibility of absorbing the different uh, layers and 
performances of different veneers, think for a second about the sheathing, the cladding, the vapor barrier, uh, the jip board, all as laminar systems that may and soon become absorbed within the context of a 3D printout. That will make this entire lecture obsolete. <laughs> you have seen this before and have spoken about this before, but I just, I love it because I learned it rather late. And it has to do with, you know, that tension that we still experience today between form and content as it becomes expressed in the triglyph of a classical um, temple. Materialized as triglyphs, they are the beams that essentially imprint themselves on the surface of the lateral edges of a temple. And all of a sudden, even if petrified, even if not wood, they make complete sense within the regime of the dialogue between structure and ornament. But once they turn the corner, all of a sudden, and if you accept the plausibility of petrification as, a, as part of that narrative, once they turn the corner, it becomes completely absurd until you realize that the ordering system of these triglyphs have to make a different accommodation when they come to the corner because the corner is never the same as the field condition of the centers. And so they shift to turn the corner in the very same way that Bramante had a crisis with and in the same way that Mies had to deal with in the Seagram's building. And this gives us the comfort and maybe the confidence that structure is always in service of the ornament and somehow the architectural discipline is what mediates between the actual and the virtual uh, the symbolic and the actual, and the world as we know it, and the world as we would like to know it to become. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about what the role of uh, your pedagogical interests are in the design of those schools? Because it seems like you, you have an overarching desire to. Uh, to to create a dialogue to uh, detail, structure, ornament, form, um, material, and those appear almost like magical in, those, in these projects. Um, whereas, let's say, a building like Milton is a little bit more raw and didactic, right? Um, so I was wondering what, what the process is. Yeah. We're working on a, on a book of schools of architecture right now, and actually this building will feature, in my mind, prominently in it. And we've had to think about, if you like, the school of architecture as a program, as a type, and as a construct which possibly builds a dialogue between a school of thought uh, and a space of learning. But of course, as we all know, schools of thought change over time. And so the philosophies that are conceptualized at, as, part, as an intrinsic part of a special place don't hold beyond a certain era after which certain intellectual regimes are overturned and new schools of thought are brought into place. But my argument has been actually despite that, that something else survives that you and I can't completely calculate, but that architecture calculates. To that end, like one example is the architectural association, which used to be placed in just two row houses. And even though it's expanded, there's something about the domesticity and, and intimacy of being in that space with a kind of concocted lecture hall that, with that L configuration, and of course the bar, which is the center of its cultural exchange, has been able to navigate uh, 
not seamlessly, but culturally, continuously, from Boyarsky to to Mohsen to to Brett Steele and onwards, I presume. And so, so my argument is there's something about architecture which is not benign and not just indifferent, but it does something different. The GSD is also another one of those examples where the typology of the theater invariably produces a condition not so much of uh, spectator and stage, but an inverted panoptic situation where you're in a theater and therefore everybody is always on view and looking at each other. And that the, then the nuances of being out in the open stage or under the underbellies of the next uh, tier acquire a different kind of resonance as a result of them have produced its own culture despite the fact that Moneo and Silvetti and you know, uh, Mac and so forth are completely different from each other and they've brought new things to those schools. In that context, uh, Georgia Tech, uh, Melbourne and Toronto have absolutely nothing to do with each other uh, in the sense that they are almost happening at the same time, but in a different state with different goals and different things. And yet, we all know that schools of architecture have some things in common. They have studio spaces or they have this and that. Um, within that context, I think, intellectually speaking, uh, the Dean of Melbourne provided us with the best framework uh, from within which to answer your question. And he asked us to engage in the, pr the project of the School of Architecture from within four lenses, of which a couple, I think, are most poignant. One has to do with the building of an academic environment that's reflective of the changing times within which we're living. And I would say, coming from MIT, you understand very well the notion of silo and the strength that each discipline brings to an academic context, all while acknowledging that any notion of disciplinarity is also breaking down in lieu of uh, transdisciplinary collaborations and interactions with fields that maybe the faculty don't do as much as the students do. So he wanted a school that would be able to foster with ease and seamlessness a breakdown of the assumed order of the centrality of each of these silos. That was important. The other thing that he said that is true of any of these other schools, the Knowlton included, is the notion that this is the one program where your clients, and I don't mean the dean of the School of Architecture, and I certainly don't mean the facilities or the president of a university, I'm talking about its main audience, which usually ends up being a thousand students and faculty, all of whom know and understand the discipline as well as you do, if not better, become your most important, fervent, and smart audience. To that end, while all architecture serves as a kind of pedagogical tool or a didactic instrument, this is the moment where it becomes that par excellence. So in all of these schools, we've tried to do a few instances that are absolutely exemplary in their formulation or in their undermining of certain canons. In that sense, the suspended studios or in some of the other kinetic parts of these buildings, or in the distribution of material organizations, we have been very deliberate in making for pedagogical buildings. Not pedagogical buildings simply as spaces of learning, but that the building begins to describe itself in terms of the logic of its material instrumentation. To that end, this building is absolutely consistent through and throughout. The distribution of concrete, plaster, and millwork it is almost uh, a, organized in a matte condition throughout, like a sponge. 
In Melbourne, you have a very finished core, you have a less finished uh, layer outside of that, and you have an absolute raw finish in the studio spaces and with only perforated zinc on the outside. So we, from a budgetary point of view, you go from uh, $270 a square foot to $200 a square foot to $150 a square foot, like an onion with different uh, budgetary constraints. And these become evident in different episodes. In Toronto, there's another agenda. And not driven by us, but certainly enhanced by us in all of those buildings because of its green content, if you like. The idea that the energy use of the building, its material deployment, and its various systems become exposed and calculated as part of the management of the building. Not only are there those things that we gauge, but there is also the ability for humans to interact, to bring natural ventilation and all that, but also to measure them as part of the ongoing living research of those buildings. So moments of exposure, mo moments of calibration, uh, treat the Toronto building as a living instrument of energy, if you like. The landscape grit program, the fabrication uh, lab are an extension of that because they are part of what produces the building itself. Uh, I didn't speak to this, but contrary to Melbourne, the majority of Toronto is built, of the ff &E is built by the school itself. So we drew it, but they built it. So th that has something to do with its, uh, its, its, um, its, uh, its lesson. So in effect, uh, this tension between the creation of a space of learning and the possibility of the culture it produces, not only in terms of a school of thought, but the cultural environment that its spatial and formal qualities uh, induce and exude is really what this is about. And it's best when certain traditions evolve that you and I could never have calculated. And I don't exactly know what happens in my schools, in these schools, but I knew what happened in the bunny lounge at RISD. And I also knew what happened on the trusses with the races that happened in the GSD. There are always the ways in which spaces are appropriated and reconstructed in the minds of the students. Sarah. Thank you for that question, and I want to make a pub another public acknowledgement here. Uh, when I took over the headship of MIT, uh, I had hardly written one article because my life's practice was growing. And yet I realized that there was a, a genuine vacuum because there was some thinking in there, and yet I didn't have the, the vehicle, the medium, by which to draw it up because it's hard to write, essentially. So those of you who don't know, uh, Sarah, as a student then, uh, became the vehicle by which we gave birth to the first publication under my leadership. And she was actually the editor of, of my text also. With great hardship, I should say, I wrote out something. Uh, but that turned out to be the first of several things that I have been working on ever since. And 
And the train ride is amazing because the internet is slow enough that you're, not, you're virtually not connected to the world. It's a kind of cold spot. <laughs> Uh, but also, it's a in the quiet car, it gives you just enough time uh, to do that which you need to do, which is think and write. So I have written more in these last two years than I have in the last 20 years, and I still don't consider myself neither a scholar nor an intellectual as such, but I uh, have produced a space, uh, if you like, of, of pockets uh, of sometimes paragraphs and sometimes uh, essays which uh, try to at least build up on some of the themes that uh, we are preoccupied with. The response to your uh, question has become an essay which will uh, essentially become uh, a book that comes out in, in the spring on schools of thought and uh, spaces of learning. Uh, I've also taken the platform of the deanship at Cooper to think through not our work, but the work of others, uh, with an essay on the work of Hashem Sarkis, of uh, Jennifer Lee and Pablo Castro, of Obra, of the work of Liam O'Brien, who you know, uh, and a handful of other people. Um, these have become also a way to come to terms with uh, the intellectual terms that others have placed before me. Uh, the question of typology in the context of Liam could not have come about without the, you know, the work of Moneo and uh, uh, Colhoun and, in my case, Widler, who preceded me at, at Cooper. So it's also an excuse to become a student again. Um, I should also say that uh, the first time I was publicly uh, prompted to write something was by Kipnis for Cadwell. Uh, so that was an, a, a, a distinct honor for me to be able to write that forward. And, uh, uh, and that for me was a huge effort, but uh, but with great pleasure, actually. So, so I say this with uh, great trepidation, but in fact, I kind of think that I, I now think of it as almost impossible not to have written for all of those years, however badly we write, um, and yet, while English being sort of my first language, it's not my uh, natural state, let's say. And so uh, becoming a student of writing is itself uh, its own phenomena at the age of 50-something.